Oh, hey. <laughs> Hello. How's Hello. it going? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> How's your morning been? Yeah, it's been good. It's a beautiful day today. Sun's it's shining, nice. you know. It's all happening. Super cracking. Have you got plans for later this evening to go out and enjoy it? Or later today, I should say? Uh, yeah, there is some. There is a few things on. Um, I've got a bit of work to get done as well, so I'm sort of playing it a little bit by by year. We're not quite done with work for the year, so you know, the last the last little bit of stuff to get done. Yeah, that's very fair. It's always nice yeah. to get it as neatly tied up as possible before kind of clocking out for Christmas. So. I think a lot of people are also trying to avoid uh, getting getting cooked before Christmas as well, or having to isolate or do anything like that. So a couple of plans um, have changed. Have uh, people people have sort of gone? Oh, we're going to do it a little bit different. We're not going to go to this place. We're going to have it at home. We're going to do this thing. So um, yeah, understandably, but yeah, we'll 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 see how we go. I've got a few hours yet before I have to make any decisions. Okay, well, I've got my fingers crossed for you that uh, you can <laughs> fly through that work and, and you're cruisy for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And Josh, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, given that you are in the middle of, you know, a, a pretty busy workload. Um, between all the pleasure. <laughs> um, my name is Bex. I'm the owner of Honey Honey Surf Camp down in beautiful Torquay. Uh, and it is... Yeah, just my absolute pleasure to, to be here and um, getting to ask Josh some questions. Uh, before we really dive into any of it, I just want to acknowledge that most of us are settlers on the land that we work on, live on. Um, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people uh, of the Kulin Nation uh, as the traditional custodians of the land that I live and work on. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded on this land. I'll pass over. Because where are you, Josh? Uh, I'm on Yalakut Willem land uh, of the Kulin Nation and obviously um, incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be here. Spent a lot of time in this very spot over the last 18 months, 24 months. So, um, of course, uh, recognise their sovereignty, never ceded, and acknowledge the leaders past, present, and emerging. There's some wonderful, there's some wonderful leaders. Yelko Willem have some fantastic, um, some fantastic leaders that uh, I have a great pleasure to know personally and work with regularly. And um, yeah, it is a it is a great pleasure to to be here on their land today, and also through the airwaves, whatever magic makes this happen face to face with you. So. <laughs> Um, so before we jump in, just for anyone who doesn't know maybe your background or, or what you do, I'm just going to read a little intro blurb on you. Um, and apologies, I am going to read because I don't want to miss anything. Um, so you're the founder uh, of a social enterprise called the Just Be Nice Project, which I'm super excited to chat to you about today. Um, a director of Tasmania's largest social server pro service provider, Colony 47, um, on the board of directors of the Port Phillip Eco Centre and Are You OK Day Ambassador. Um, and you've been the recipient of a range of awards and scholarships um, for outstanding contribution to social impact and non-for-profit non leadership as well. Um, we know you're keenly focused on changing the way that we help people um, and, and creating an environment that people can get what they need when they need it for as long as they need. And I love that that kind of comes up several times in your work, which is a, a beautiful sentiment. Um, and that goes across the spectrum of like housing, uh, employment, mental health, all those sorts of things. Uh, and you're also a long time business owner um, as well as a, a social entrepreneur. And so you have that beautiful ability to bridge that gap between social responsibility and then taking it to, to corporations, companies, and kind of, um, sharing your wisdom and sharing ways that people can help, which is really lovely. Uh, and I've written down it. So at the heart of your work is the commitment to creating extraordinary positive change in the world through making ordinary positive change, which I loved. So thank you for being here. That's, I mean, when we said you've got a lot on, that's, that's. A lot. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's <laughs> probably why. Yeah, that's right. I might be committed. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> 
it's a, it's a there's, a, there's a lot to do. There's a lot. There's yeah. a lot to be done. You know? There's a lot to be done. <laughs> definitely a decent resume for sure and I think I cut that down a lot as well so um yeah thank you um and I do uh, just from a, a personal um standpoint I, I wanted to chat with you today and I'm so grateful to chat to you today because through the pandemic you've been such a voice for kind of calm um and I think reason like even even when you've been you know passionate about something it's never gone to throwing to things that are super extreme or like working people up into a frenzy. It's always been bringing it back to just like a calm and actual conversation about what's happening, which I've certainly appreciated as a, a follower of yours. Um, and I'm sure many other people have as well. So thank you for, for being that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll jump into some questions for you. So your um, the Just Be Nice project, Originally, it started as um, an offshoot from your uh, your clothing wear company, um, Odin Sport, is my understanding. Well, what happened was, you know, I've, I've been trying to solve this problem for ever, you know, and ironically, in the social service space, and certainly in the in the, in the charitable space, it's the it, it's probably the only industry where you can start with no qualifications no idea what you're doing and actually get like applauded for just starting something so someone can spend 60 years of their life not paying attention not caring about anything in particular walk past a homeless person one day go oh i felt sad today i'm going to start a thing and people will go oh amazing well done amazing so there's this incredibly low bar to entry, which means there's a lot of really poor outcomes for people who need help. And so I, I started since forever, you know, like you said at the beginning there, I've always been wondering, there's so much goodwill, there's so many resources, why don't people get the help that they need when they need it for as long as they need it, regardless of how they come to need help? And how do we address that? What's the best way? So I actually spent like a lifetime of community service alongside my work um, sort of going, you've got to be really good at something to have a good impact. You can't, you can't be not very good at something and have an extraordinary amount of impact in that something. It's just the better you are at it, the more you're able to do. That's, that's just the way, that's just truth, you know? So how do we do it and, and how do we solve this problem and, and not, not to be working it out not to just start and then try and work it out as you go because because you're dealing with people or you're dealing with communities because you're asking for trust and vulnerability you can't practice on humans like that you know we don't test we don't test products on animals we don't test products on humans for a reason and it's because it's not good for them but people test interventions on them all the time lay people with good intentions absolutely good intentions but poor execution, poor knowledge, you know, under, underdeveloped ideas about what might help, huge blind spots. And so I wanted to do that first. I wanted to have the answers first. So I spent a lot of time in all kinds of different organisations and all kinds of different communities doing all kinds of different work until sort of identified the problems, what we thought they would, might be, where the challenges were, where the blockers were, where the opportunities are, and then realised, like, actually, it's the ecosystem of help generally that is hedged against good outcomes for people who need help. So that's when I went, all right, well, we've got Just Be Nice. That's, the, that's the, the framework here. We've got this ecosystem that we can, start to, we can start to resource. And then because I already had a couple of businesses at the time as well, I was like, well, of course, with so much resource in, in enterprise, that's, we're, we're going to try and use that. We're going to try to give them a chance to help. I'll put my stuff up first. You know, I'll go first as well and show everyone that it can work. So that that's how we integrated into the you know the few things I had a hand on, and that was that were the first I suppose partnerships. And of course, you know, I I was in charge of them, so it was easy for me to organise <laughs> that. But I didn't want to be like I don't want to be one of those people that's like you do it, and they're like you're not even doing it. And I was like, yeah, that's very cool. You know, so the first the first step was to do it and show people that it's good and you can do it and it ma it makes sense, and then go from there so it was a lot of it was a lot of behind the scenes work for many many years to develop a sort of sophisticated you know complete ecosystem and framework that that could work for the just be nice project and then just start 
bringing in bringing in resources where we can. Yeah, fantastic. And it's grown obviously so much since since you first. Started. It's been a long. It's been a long time. Yeah. So we've been doing it a long time. It was like seven or eight years ago, I think, something like that. Now, so you know, it's been it's been it's been going for a while. So. <laughs> Yeah, which is amazing. <laughs> and, and something that you said in there was that people meaning well, but they'll, they'll kind of just go and, you know, do whatever they can. Um, yep. Something that I've found personally, and, and I know you've spoken to this on, um, like in, in other interviews and uh, on your YouTube channel as well, is the misconceptions that go around people that actually need help. So um, I consider myself a, a fairly compassionate person and I had this weird privilege of um, when I was a, a kid, my parents both worked at the local prison. And so back in the day when I had a sick day from school, somehow it was okay for me to go with them to, to work. Um, yeah. And so I got to see people who were there for, you know, murder and, and these really horrible crimes and have them be really lovely to me, like take me in and make rumbles with me while I was sick and like treat me really well. And as a kid, I, you know, we got this really simple answer of, yeah, they made bad choices, right? So then as an adult, I never questioned that. It was just like, yeah, the, you know, these people are in the situations they're in because they made bad choices. And we, we do, like, we kind of get really simple answers as a kid, like, oh, these people are dangerous or these people are lazy or, like, whatever it is that we carry into adulthood and maybe don't question. Uh, and so even though I had that compassion to them and saw them as, like, a whole person, I was still like, yeah, but they've made bad choices. Um, yeah. I think... For me, what really opened my eyes to it, and it had to be personal, of course, for me to realize, was leaving an abusive relationship and finding myself without a support network, with no money, with no, you know, house, no job, anything, because I, I left the state um, on borrowed money, basically, to get away. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that stopped me from being homeless was my knowledge that, you know, from having traveled in the past, from having that privilege, that backpackers would let you work for accommodation. And so mm -hmm. because I'm personable, I was able to go and do that for a while, but I, I didn't have access to food regularly. Like I was food insecure. And it, it's so funny that, that that thought as well carried through to that. And I was like, well, I can't ask for help. I've made this choice. Like, this has been my decision. And it was that, that same old program where I actually probably really needed help at that particular time. So I guess how do we how do we start to unpack that for people like those you know those misconceptions and those ideas that we've had formed generally as a society of how we understand people who are struggling so that we can actually have equal opportunities for everyone and we're not restricting and saying well this is like this helps only for you if you meet this very you know specific set of criteria how how do we make it accessible to everyone and change people's mind that that's okay yeah i mean it's a really great question and it's a very it's a very big question it's a, it's a big problem <laughs> and um, it, no 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 not not at all i mean we're just at risk of me waxing lyrical and giving a little ted talk here um so there's a couple of there's a couple of things in that and you know one is obviously one speaks to the to the outcomes that we've been trying to develop which is you know getting all the help you need regardless of how you come to need it you know and until we, until you're better you know and and at the moment there no one even no one no other organization even has that as their as their mo it's not no one's goal you know no one has set an outcome and that was something that was that took a while you know to go well what is this outcome that feels like it's achievable feels like it's not overly paternal feels like it's um possible but also necessary and so that's why um i ended up with this sort of baseline uh, equality of opportunity kind of idea that you know there's housing employment and, and mental health good mental health outcomes and the reason that you picked those three is because if you're missing any one of them the others are at risk if yeah. you're housed and employed but your mental health is poor you're at risk of losing your employment or your housing if you're yeah. if you're employed and your mental health is good you've got no housing then your mental health is at risk and your employment's at risk you know if you've got housing and good mental health and no employment or your housing is at risk and obviously your mental health is at risk 
there are a lot of places doing those things independently or, or, or wanting to or, or claiming to be working towards those outcomes independently. But if you don't do them all together, then you're always leaving people hanging a little bit. And if you don't finish the job, then they get worse. So one thing that we do, um, and I do very regularly, I do it with organisations, I do it with schools, is, is work on a thing called, that, that I've called impact literacy, which is that people believe that because they're people, they know how to help other people. And that's just not true. Helping is a skill like anything else. It is something that takes a long time to learn, is incredibly complicated. The more complicated the circumstance, the more difficult the help is going to be. Um, it's often resource heavy. Now, there's a couple of reasons that people have poor impact literacy. One is the way that we sell impacts at the moment, the way that we sell charitable impacts. And the way that we sell chari charity, and that has been sold since, say, television and, and advertising became such a heavy part of, of selling charitable impacts, is that they basically run through this template of, of five things. They go, here's a huge statistic. Here's a picture or a video. Here's the thing that we do. Here's the little thing you can do. Change someone's life forever. Yeah. One in 10, one in five, 20,000, 100,000. Homeless guy on the street, uh, Indigenous kid in red dirt running around, sick kid in the hospital. We're going to give him a coffee, ask a question. We're putting up a poster, morning tea, whatever, party. Give us five bucks, paint a nail, grow a moustache, do a marathon, change someone's life forever. And what that's teaching people, what that's teaching people is there's a worst problem. There's a, there's a, uh, you can tell by looking at people. There's a best solution. You can do little something and you change someone's life forever. None of that is true. That is the complete opposite of the reality. There is no worst problem. You definitely can't tell by looking at someone. There is no best single intervention. $5 of good does about $5 of good. And changing someone's life forever is actually incredibly difficult. You either need enormously high levels of trust or resources or skill to be able to do that. Now, yeah. some people in some circumstances can have an enormously large impact on someone, but it's not. there's no generic thing that you can do. So if someone you really trusts you and knows you and you know them and you know, and we hear this, we hear these uh, about these sort of um, epiphanous moments that, that people have with like a teacher that's known them for a long time or something. And, and in a moment where you're having a bad day and they go, you're doing great and you're really good and you're going to be great. That might be an opportunity for them to change your life. And so we get all these speakers running around going, I had this teacher, they said they believed in me. And then it just built me up again and I went out and now I've been able to go and be an athlete or do this thing, do this business thing, whatever. And what people take from that is you've got to tell people you believe in them. But what they don't take from that is you need to show up every day for six years in this person's life, building that trust, being that person that they believe when they say stuff, you know, leading by example to get the opportunity to have that moment, which you probably aren't even doing on purpose. You're not grabbing someone and going, I believe in you now. Go and you know, go and get your, get drafted into the AFL. You just you're in passing, just having a conversation with someone you regularly chat to, who you've got an eyeball on, and that trust piece is missed all the time in these conversations. So we've oversold the possibilities and we've made it overly transactional. And in that process, we've been telling people, or you know, charities in particular have been telling people, you get this because. We ha the charity has to tell you that you get it so that you give them money. You understand how bad this could be. This speaks to your heart. You know, give us the money because we're explicitly or implicitly saying that we, uh, we deserve it more than someone else. Yeah. The truth is that people need <clears throat> a series of interventions often. They need a whole bunch of things and the complexity or the difficulty of delivering that is almost directly related to how quickly you start dealing with it. If you break your arm and you go to the hospital immediately, you get seen, you get sorted, you'll be better in six weeks. Yeah. If you leave it and, it and it gets worse, this has become six, 12 months, 18 months rehab, potentially never regain function. You have to get it broken again. You'll have to get rods put in. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's not that the broken arm is not able to be fixed. It's that if we don't do it quickly, then there are additional complications. And this is the case for lots of people that are in, 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 
in challenging times. But we have these weird gatekeepers for when we decide we want to help people. Do you look like this? Are you from here? Are you this much in trouble or only a little bit in trouble? Like, and, and so people don't get, they don't get access to that kind of help. And so that's a challenge. Yeah. So there are all of these things that sort of coalesce to create a, an inefficient ecosystem. And they also um, benefit organisations that uh, don't invest or don't have to invest in large amounts of infrastructure for actually helping. So if you, if you consider an organisation whose main MO is awareness, they have no infrastructure burden. Their whole cost is self-promotion and message delivery. So they're at a distinct advantage to another organisation that's heavily infrastructure heavy or investment heavy in people because for every thousand dollars they get, they've got to spend nine hundred and fifty dollars of it delivering service. Whereas these guys have got, you know, a thousand dollars to continue to grow their brand of awareness. So there's a there's a power imbalance in, in that sense too. And people don't believe it's possible to help a lot of people. And fundamentally that's one of the huge challenges is you've got to believe that people, you know, if you give with the right amount of care and patience and understanding and love um, and trust and amenity will lean into the help and will get it, uh, you know, and, 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 can, and can get better. But again, if we don't have that help there, people don't ask for it. And it's actually fair enough because there's nowhere to go really to ask for it. So, there's nowhere you can go and say, listen, I'm buggered. I don't know what's going on, but can I get some help? That doesn't. That place doesn't really exist. Um, and and because of that, people don't ask. And because they don't ask, then they don't get it. And sometimes if you do ask and don't get it, that damages your trust in the institution of help, and then you disengage as well. So there's a whole range of reasons why it doesn't work. And, you know, at Just Be Nice, we've sort of got answers for all of those things. We've got setups of those kinds of things. But, again you're battling this kind of very simplistic understanding of help that markets really well, that has a really great, they've got really great elevator pitches, they've got really pithy lines, they've got all these wonderful things and, and it takes time. So, you know, we've got to settle in for the long term to, to change the way that people help people. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a beautifully complex answer to a huge question that I asked you. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I especially love the analogy of the broken arm because I, I think, like, you're so right. We we kind of wait till it gets far, far worse before we even start to notice that there's a problem there, you know, like we... we, we wait even, bef this. even before that. So yeah. here's the, the thing that I often say to people, you know, if you break your arm surfing and you go to the hospital and they go, oh, okay, what's going on? So my arm hurts. First of all, you don't have to diagnose your own broken arm. You just have to go, it hurts a lot. I don't, I don't know for sure. So you don't have to guess who to call. You don't have to guess which service to engage with. You just go to the hospital. The second thing that doesn't happen is they don't go, how'd you do it? And you say, surfing. And then they go, we don't do surfing broken arms here. <laughs> or they go, what are you doing surfing? Like, you're too old. What's the, you know, the waves were too big. That's a silly decision. Why would you do that? You're on your own, mate. That's your that's your choice. You live with it. They don't yeah. do that. They just go, whatever. The only reason they wouldn't see you is because they don't have a bed. That's it. And then I'd say, we're, we're making a call down the road, you know, in lawn. They've got a spot. They'll be able to do it. I know it's an hour away, but you'll be right. We're just going to send you down there. And they'll put you in an ambulance and they'll send you to lawn. Yeah. And we don't do that. We don't do that with social help. They go, nah, you're the wrong person, wrong injury. You did that yourself. You have to you have to first of all work out who to call. You have to go, I think it's broken. I've got to find the right person for a broken arm. The onus is often on the most vulnerable person to work it all out. And all of that is backwards. All of that it drives me insane. But in a hospital, you just walk in. And the great thing about the hospital is if you've been knocked out and broken your arm, and I was just walking by on the beach and I don't know you, and I'm also not a doctor, I could just call an ambulance. Yeah. Someone's not right. I don't know what's going on, but she's kind of out. Her arm's at a funny angle. I'll sit with her for a sec, but can you come? Yeah. But you can be sitting across from your, your best friend in the whole world you've known your whole life, and they're like, I'm not okay. And you've got to work out who to call yeah. as a lay person. Yeah. I don't know. Is it financial? Is it emotional? You know, are you having trouble with work? Do you need, you know, what, like, 
Why do I have to now diagnose all of these complex problems? Why do I now have to work it out? And so the ultimate goal for JVN is that you just be able to say, hey, my friend's struggling. What can we do? And we go, all right, we start a triage process. We start with the right people to work out. Okay, here are some pressure points. Here's some stresses. Here's some vulnerabilities. Let's work on them. Some of them we can resolve quickly. Some are going to take a long time. But we'll, we'll just keep bringing resources and people and the right stuff and putting them in the right order until you get better. And until we have that, our job, you know, well, my job is is not done. Yeah. I was going to ask how how far along, like, if if I did have a friend who was really struggling, how far along in that process are you? Can I, can I call you up and be like, hey, Josh, <laughs> help? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, look, people do, people do call up. The way, it, the, the way it works at the moment, because it's all resource dependent, so, if, you know, back to the beds analogy, it's really about how many beds we've got and whether they're yeah. full or not, you know. And so... Um, because of that and because there aren't heaps of beds, because it's incredibly difficult to, to drag people away from the things they've been doing and, and to work with us, we, we work on referrals. So referrals from partners who where we've got setups with to say, and they'll call up and they'll say, you know, Pete's got a problem. This is where Pete's at. We'll get a little brief. And if we've got the resources to help, we'll say, no worries, you know, connect us and we'll have a chat. But if we don't, we'll be like, sorry, we, we don't have the ability to help Pete. Pete hasn't been told no to his face because yeah. that stops that stops people reaching out for help too. Can I get help? No. Can I get help? No. You know what? I'm not asking again. It's too hard. Yeah. I'm just going to lump it. So until until we're comfortable that people can just call in because we can pretty much pick everybody up, um, it's referrals. And you know, the quicker the quicker more people help, the quicker we get more stuff going on. Obviously, you know, um, then then the sooner we'll be able to just set it up so that people can just call in, which is obviously the the end goal. The goal. Yeah, amazing. I think that's so desperately needed because I'm, I'm even thinking of situations myself where like, I've been in that situation where I've had a friend across from yeah. me going like, I, I don't know who to call. And it's it's not even just the trying to figure out what's going on for them, but also even if I know that that idea that if I give them the wrong person that doesn't actually care, it's just going to make it so much worse. And so I'm, I've got that real like, Onus to, to choose so carefully and make sure that yeah they'll do no harm yeah yeah so I I'm excited to to have that up and running I I'll tell you right now um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people here who are great um, yeah sorry, I've gone off um I've gone off topic off my questions a little bit so I'm sorry no that's okay I probably, probably dragged you off a little bit I'm sorry I'll wax I'll just carry on. I'll just carry on for days if you if you if you let me go I'm sorry um one of my favorite things that I've heard you say, and it's just a beautiful little phrase is um, walking people out of their fears. Uh, so I love it for so many reasons, partly because usually when we we're faced with someone who's scared of something that, that we, you know, want to be like, no, that's not nothing you need to be scared of. Like come do this. Um, yeah. We kind of almost take like an adversarial, like, you know, approach to it um, and, and try and prove to them why they're wrong. And what I love about walking someone out of their fear is it's, it's got all the connotations of meeting them where they're at, working with them, stepping with them, you know, and, and letting it be a gentle process that's not like a straightaway hard, fast thing. Um, I was going to ask you about it in relation to people's mis misconceptions of people who are struggling and, and but you're so welcome to answer in relation to that. But I actually was thinking coming into Christmas and um, families and especially I know in my family, I've got quite a big family and there's people disagreeing on vaccinations yeah. and, and all those sorts of things. And people are really scared on both sides of those conversations. Yeah. Do you have any practical advice for for that gentle walking like how do we how do we approach it as people when they you know we, we want to have these conversations but we need to kind of de-armor that fear first it's it's a, it's, a, it's another great question and and it's what it's a great challenge and and it it requires it requires some um emotional labor i think that we've we've probably if we consider it an emotional muscle probably a lot of people have have let theirs get a little bit weak over the last 10 years. You know, we've, we've, we've not been incentivized to have ongoing good conversations with people we don't necessarily agree with. People are very quick to 
Um, very quick to write people off. Um, one thing that I see in my work, you know, I work in a space, it's, it's aspirational, it's supposed to be understanding, we're supposed to be caring, there's all these wonderful things, and there are a lot of people that do really great work in this space. Unfortunately, there's this also, sometimes you get this strange, what I could, would consider a, a contradiction or a tension, where you've got these people who are advocating for communities that are in need, or, or individuals, or, or learnings to sort of advance how people might better understand one another and these things. But, they've, but it's coupled with an incredible impatience for people who don't agree with them. And what I've always found really difficult is if I'm advocating for these guys who've, you know, and, and prison, you know, former prison is a great example, you know. You've got these people, they've made some, some decisions, they've, they've, they've been to prison, they've done these things. Their personal circumstances are often such that you can look at them and go, look, I understand how you might have some stunted emotional development in that space you know that actually makes sense to me um and there are all of these circumstances surrounding your life that have made it very challenging for you and ultimately you've made some bad decisions and you, i'm not saying you shouldn't be punished for those decisions you know you've, you've had a you, whatever you've, you've done a thing and it was bad and, and that's okay but i want to be understanding about how we can make you again a functional person who's not likely to do it again who's happy who's independent who's got those opportunities to do those things if you have that advocacy for communities, for kids, for people, for migrants, for refugees, for former prisoners, for people who are leaving domestic violence situations, whatever it happens to be, and you're advocating for understanding of meeting them where they are to give them the help that they need, then you have to also be understanding of people who are extremely conservative, who've grown up in another place, who have a certain set of ideas, who have a certain set of beliefs that sort of, in your view, and often, objectively uh, are contrary to the truth of how things are yeah. but you have to be understanding of them as well meet them where they are bring them from where they are and it's easy to say that's stupid that's racist that's wrong that's dumb and just be annoyed and not talk to them anymore but yeah what's that doing you know what are we what's the point of this conversation i want i want to bring you a little bit closer a little bit further and it's really difficult to change someone's whole mind in a 30 minute, one hour, two hour conversation. So just because you're right doesn't mean that they'll get it straight away. The winner is the person who keeps the conversation going, who leaves the door open. Yeah. And if you can, if you can relieve yourself of the pressure of having everyone get it right away and be just prepared to just be like, listen, where's the level where I can not win the conversation today? but keep it going for 10 years if necessary, yeah. then it's worth it. It's yeah. worth it. Because how else are you going to change it? And, and, and the impatience, what that leads to is people only speaking to people who agree with them. Yeah. And it's one of my issues with, with some forms of activism where you get these people, there might be a thousand people and they're all standing around, they're screaming at each other and they're cheering. Yeah. And it's like, these, these people already agree with you. What about this is bringing one person over who doesn't agree with you at all? Yeah. What about this is opening the door for one person whose mind you're trying to change? And okay. if, if you're in the business of trying to bring people together and, and, and change minds and, and help people see things and educate, then it's not about you being right. It's about you being able to keep people in the room for as long as yeah. possible and giving them the best chance. Meet people where they are, where they need help. Meet people where they are, where they need to learn meet people where they are to feel good, you know, and if you can take that attitude and, and that level of patience across the board, then you relieve that tension, which I actually think relieves some of that emotional labour. Now, I get frustrated like anybody else. I swear, I get annoyed, I, I rant, you know, I'll turn the phone off and go, oh, my goodness, it's so frustrating, these people, how do they think that? You know, I, I look at the Herald Sun, I look at the things ScoMo <laughs> says, I get so annoyed. You know, it's really frustrating. But what's the alternative? What are we doing to speak to people who think, oh, that sounds like the truth? You go, yeah. we can't just, I can't just speak to people that agree with me all day long. And, yeah. and being right is not enough. You know, yeah. being able to bring people together and bring people along is better. And if, if I 90% agree with someone, I'm not trying to win the last 10%. If I 0% agree with someone, I'd rather spend time trying to get them to 10% agree with me than yeah. get someone who 90% agrees with me to 
a hundred percent agree with me. Yeah. Because no one a hundred percent agrees with me. No one hundred percent agrees with anybody. But there's so much fighting amongst people who pretty much agree that they just ignore the fact that there's another sixty percent of the population who want nothing to do with them. Yeah. Yeah. That is so true. So where, where's your time better spent? You know, we're all we're all pretty much on the same page. Enough. You know. And we can we can engage in conversation and I might learn and I might go, okay, cool, five years ago I didn't have my pronouns in my bio and I didn't know that and then okay and it took a bit of time to do this and that's fine. This guy's still all the way back on gay marriage. We need to go talk to this guy and be like, mate, you know, like that's the guy. Not yeah. not 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 the last little bit over here between us. If you and if you can be happy with taking someone who doesn't agree with you and keeping them in a conversation and seeing that as a win and taking someone who doesn't agree with you and getting them to five percent, you know, yeah. engage at least and maybe understand or or go, all right, I kind of see how you get there and whatever, then that's better. You know, that's a better result. Yeah, beautiful. I think definitely bringing that level of understanding and patience i think that's a really really good takeaway being patient and not expecting it straight away not expecting to be able to just like snap your fingers yeah. and, and make it so which is the same it's the same expectation we have of people dealing with trauma or challenging times or you know being upset you know it's going come on you know it's get over it is yeah is not a great way to move people along you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes some people need a little bit of, you know, you need a little bit of, come on, mate, let's go. But, <laughs> but we still need to be understanding. And if you if you've got that patience only in one direction, that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a tension that is not good for your gut. <laughs> you know, no. like that doesn't help. It's it, I don't know how people I don't know how people do it. Yeah, it's much easier to be understanding across the board. Still get frustrated, but okay. with understanding. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's, yeah, that's a beautiful answer. And, and I hope that there's somewhere, someone on here who um, can, can take that and, and use, I know I will be with my family. <laughs> it's a very, a very helpful and practical thing. And um, with Christmas, New Year's holiday season, it's obviously can at the best of times, maybe be a bit stressful and busy. Um, at the worst of times, it can be like extremely physically, emotionally, uh, mentally distressing for some people. Yeah. Um, do you have just any like quick tips or just little practices maybe that you use yourself or that you see as being really helpful if someone is really struggling this season or feeling like the weight of the world on their shoulders from the pressure of it all? Is, is there mm -hmm. any little practical things that you would recommend? Yeah, there's a couple of things. One is to is to manage is to manage your expectations and then your energies. I think that's important. I think um, people people sometimes uh, get overwhelmed with the feelings of um, uh, obligation at this time of year, and you know, manage it. You know, you can manage it yourself, but also be aware that it's not all about you all the time, and that. You, by focusing on what's possible around you, you can also take a bit of that pressure off too. If you only consider how you feel all the time, I mean, eventually you're going to be out, you know, if you just think about how much your shoulder hurts, if it, your shoulder's going to hurt worse, it's going to hurt longer. But if you think about, like, what you can do with it and you kind of forget when you're doing other stuff, then that's good too. And I think focusing on the positive stuff rather than the negative, focusing on, um, on, on, what you can do and what you can do for others and then managing your energy in that space and being like, I don't want to do the full thing. I'm going to do half the thing here. I'm going to have a little breather. That's okay. You know, it, people would rather you showed up in some fashion um, that you're okay with than not at all, or that make uh, overwhelmingly people would rather that you're okay. People that care about you would rather you're okay. Yeah. And I think that managing your energy while also paying attention to what you can do for others is a great way to, keep you not just living in your own head all the time because yeah. it's a spiral that we've been doing for two years and yeah. no one ben no one who has a problem benefits from just sitting there and thinking about their own problems all day every day it's no one would recommend that no one would recommend that and you know give yourself little things and just do those little things those little pithy little things um i think looking after the people that you have a hand on is really important don't look past just the people around you um to help 
if you know someone who's a bit like that or you are a bit like that yourself, you know, just be like, cool, well, the people that are here, what can I do for them and what am I prepared to do? And, and that's good. We don't need to do grand gestures. We don't need to do these huge, massive things. Yeah. But we also need to look past the people that are close to us to do some good somewhere else or later on or whatever. People are going to benefit from that. And then the other little helpful tip that I like to give people is to offer something. If you know someone's a little bit rough, offer some help because there's something there's something about uh, adjusting help that's been offered to you that is easier than asking for help outright. So if we, yeah. if we reflect back to when you needed food, for instance, you're yeah. food insecure, and you've just gone to the shop, you've managed to, you've got, you know, 40 bucks in tips, and you've been to the shop, and you've just picked up a few things. And then I say, hey, let me buy you dinner tonight, Friday night. And you go, you've got dinner. So in your head, you're like, oh, like you're thinking, I've got dinner. Um, I don't want to waste it, obviously, because you spent 40 bucks. You go, oh, could we do Monday night? Yeah. Because Monday night, I don't have dinner. Yeah. Now, how much easier from your point of view is it to say, could we do Monday night? Then can you buy me dinner on Monday night cold? A hundred percent. It's a thousand asked. times easier yeah. to just say, can you do it on Monday? You know, it's like yeah. so much easier. So even though the help that I've offered wasn't exactly spot on, it's, it's easier to adjust help that's been offered and say, oh, actually Monday would be great. Yeah. Then to come up to someone and say, listen, I've got food for Saturday and Sunday, but can you take me out for dinner on Monday? There's something yeah. about it. I don't know why, and I don't know if it's something we all need to overcome or whatever, but if you're trying to help, just offering something and being prepared yeah. to be flexible with that is a really great way to keep a hand on people. Do you need me to come and have a beer with you on Monday? Oh, if we could do Tuesday, that'd be great, because it's the day after my family thing. I know I'm going to be stressed, you know, like blah, 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 blah. You know, it'd be great to have a debrief, or I will do that. You know, no dramas. And so I think if we take that attitude of going first and offering something, that's a little thing you can do for people around you to make sure that they know that they've got eyeballs on them and someone cares, but they've got a little bit of agency as well to sort of fill the gap. And yeah. so those are sort of little tips that I think are useful to get through this time. And just remember, it's one week out of the year. It's actually such an arbitrary time, Christmas. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. an, it's just an arbitrary nothing time. And if you can't be bothered, don't worry about it. Just catch up with your friends later on. Do your thing later on. Whatever. It's We just made up a day. Yeah. And that's it. And now everyone freaks out about it. But it is, at the end of the day, it's just a day where but we have, what, some people have four days off work. And that's yeah. it's a long weekend. You know? <laughs> yeah, 100%. We made a bit of a mountain out of a molehill where it really Big does. time. Yeah. yeah. And if you love it and it's great, great. And if you don't, that's also great. You know, whatever. Yeah. Who cares? Catch up with everybody in March. It really makes no difference. Yeah, yeah, that was so true. Um, and, and you've actually kind of answered my second part to this question, which was how do we create safe spaces for our humans? But it's, it's kind of the same answer pretty much, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, which is great. Um, if there's someone listening today who is just like so clumped up on everything you've said, and they're like, yes, like we need this system. We need like, we need the work that you're doing. Yeah, exactly. To, to, you know, come to life. How can they help? If, if they're in a position to help, how could they help you grow? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the first thing I'd say is, is, is look, look around you always. Don't, don't look to someone like myself or someone, you know, and go, ah, oh, that's the whole thing. I mean, Obviously, I'll, the Just Be Nice project, we'd love everybody to get involved and, and help out. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that. But what I would love more at the beginning is for people to not look past the people near them. Be a good friend. Be a good family member. Be a good member in the community. Have good manners. You know, if, you, if you're horrible to wait staff and hospital staff and people in traffic and your neighbours and your family and all these sorts of things, like you've got room for growth that you should be pursuing every day and you should be trying to do that and, and trying to, you know, cultivate an attitude of not getting it right all the time. I mean, I don't get it right all the time, but but a North Star against which you can audit your behaviour of saying, am I showing up? Am I caring? Am I doing that? Because along the way, you're going to re you're going to learn about how, how much time and understanding it actually takes to help people. And that's really critical. Yeah. Stop, so you're not looking for easy wins all the time because you realise, okay, it's, there's very few easy wins. Usually there's a lot, lot goes into it. But then after that, or while you're doing that, if you want to um, sort of reach out to us, 
jbnproject.com. We're redoing the web page at the moment, but I mean, it's still there. It's not, not there, but there's a new one going up. But you can just go to how, how can I help, um, I think is the name of the tab. And there's a bunch of stuff in there. You can put in your deets and, and we can get in touch about you doing some stuff or your workplace. Um, there's a few little like affiliate links and stuff. If you, I mean, Christmas shopping is probably done. You should be done now. I don't think you'll get anything shipped by now. But, you know, there's that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you can get your workplace to book JBN for workshops or, or speaking and all that kind of thing too. So, you know, there's all of that that's, you know, we've got all of these kind of random things. And, uh, yeah, you, you just pop your stuff in there and then we, we can get you on board. But, you know, obviously on top of all that, it is really important that you, that you look after the people close to you and don't get too – who want to change the world, but if you're not looking after the people to the left and right of you, you're not going to be able to change the world. You don't, it doesn't get easier to help a million people than five. Yeah. You know, it's easier to help one person than it is to help a million. And don't skip to a million. Do one, yeah. ten, a hundred, a thousand, you know, ten thousand. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. And then I guess it also speaks to not deferring that to you to to make it happen it's it's not the just throw your money at it and and let you figure it out it's like no no actually do the work yeah pay attention and, and in that process you might notice the gaps like you did like i've got yeah. somewhere to live but my food's insecure and so now when we're having the chat you're going all right well how about this how do we fill this gap what you know how do i get that and that's great too you know that's important that's important work and they're important insights um but you only know that if you've done it yourself or you're doing it with other people or, or that sort of thing so it's all very valuable and all together you know, we aspire to be the very best place for people to help people. Like, to just go, there's no better place. But at the same time, I'm not saying abandon your responsibilities where you are in place to just come here and, like, yeah. have your guilt absolved about, you know, whether or not you're doing good or not. Like, yeah. do both. And if you have to start somewhere, if you have to do something, do the one close to you first. That's the thing I would say do first, you know. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and if there's someone listening, so I, like, I... I think we both agree like everyone deserves a safe place to sleep and to be um, during their days, uh, food and support, access to support. If there's someone listening to this who is like, I don't have one or all of those things. Like I, I need help. I'm struggling in one of these areas. Is there anywhere that you would recommend them reaching out to support first or, or what to even start looking for? Yeah, look, that is one of the great challenges and, and this is one of the things that um, that is difficult for people to understand also is that the help that's available is heavily related to where you are geographically yeah. and also what, what kind of challenges you're having, which is one of the most frustrating things. So in housing, for instance, there's all kinds of supply-side problems, as in whether there's enough places at all, let alone whether they're affordable, you know, and that is different in different locations. So clients in, in rural New South Wales where they don't have certain kinds, you know, there aren't lots of one-bedroom apartments in the middle of, you know, New South Wales. So if you're a young person and you're looking for housing, it's very difficult to find a place on your own. If you don't have a car, it gets even more difficult. So there are very... There are very few places for that kind of comprehensive help, um, which is, again, why, why I started JBN. What there are is there are, and, and, I, and I often lead off any sort of mental health discussions about this, if you are, and unfortunately Christmas time is an, is an emotionally stressful time, if you think someone's at risk of hurting themselves or someone else, you can call the police and they can come and take them to hospital to have a mental health assessment. And it's not an arrest. They don't get in trouble for it. There's nothing like that. It's just a, there's a there's a, a mechanism in place that um, allows the police to restrain people who are believed to be a danger to themselves or someone else and take them in for mental health assessment and support in yeah. hospital, which I recommend if you think that. And this is a, unfortunately a, an unfortunate reality of this time of year that that happens. If you think that they're having a bad time, um, but it's not like a chronic time right at this moment, you um, encourage them to go to the GP, where they can help with a mental health uh, assessment mm. plan and, and, and do that. They sort of bring together a team of mental health support around you. If you do that, book a long appointment. It's got to be at least 20 minutes. So if, if for some clinics you have a regular appointment and then a long appointment, it needs to be 20 minutes. They need that time to get the assessment. Encourage them, take them, do that, and that's a great starting point. 
DHHS have wonderful resources, but also they're heavily oversubscribed in a lot of areas as well. Yeah. And so you end up with these challenges. There's wait lists and there's, there's no one place you can go at the moment. Obviously, that's why, you know, why we're doing JBN. And it is a great frustration of mine, um, but council services are, um, sometimes have good directories for help in place in the municipality that you're in, which is obviously yeah. you've been in the surf coast, you know, I'm in Port Phillip. Even between Port Phillips, Donington and Kingston, which are kind of the next few here, the services are different. What they have is different. The amenity is different. And because of that, further out you go, it, 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 there are different – some places do some things really well and some places have some kinds of help that they do really well. Yeah. And you kind of – you're lucky if you fall into that category. And, again, yeah. that's why it's quite disappointing. You know, it's quite a disappointing setup. But unfortunately, at the moment, there is no one place that you can call, which yeah, is, you know, it's upsetting, but it is the reality that we're trying to, we're trying to fix it. <laughs> yeah, something to work on, right? Yeah. Um, I have to say, I think we're actually super fortunate in the Surf Coast. I, we have a, a food bank that I love their setup um, yep. because they, it's just like an open cafe with all the food and it's pay what you want or pay what you can. Yeah. And so they've yeah. just got their bank tooth details stuck up on the wall as you're exiting. Um, and if you pay or not, no one will know, no one can tell. And they encourage people who can pay full price to come in and buy the stuff as well as their way of being funded yeah. for that food. Yeah. Um, and I just, every time I'm in there, I'm just like, this is a, a really perfect way to do it without that judgment and without questioning people for, for if they really need it or like anything like that. It's, it's a beautiful way to do it yeah absolutely yeah food bank do a great job there's a number of for, for some like some of the food security places there's 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 quite a bit of help around in that in that space accommodation housing because it's so infrastructure heavy is one of the challenging challenging spaces really um yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. Limited. at the moment but food, yeah food, food bank and they did a great job through you know through COVID for a lot of people that were that were struggling financially and, and that sort of thing it's you know food, food bank and Oz Harvest and you know there's there's plenty of places doing those sort of repurposing and providing cheap meals and things which is which is really good fantastic yeah 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 it's really good to see um I'm gonna stop asking you questions because I've kept you here for so long. I'm so sorry. No, no, <laughs> that's saying... okay. No, no, no <laughs> apologies. I'm sorry. I've been here. I've been here chatting your ear off. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful. Um, it's been really, really fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing all that knowledge. Um, I, I don't know if you were watching the comments as they were coming up, but there was so many people that were resonating with what you were saying. Um, oh, and there was cool. a, a question that came through as well of if this will be posted later. If I can save it and Instagram doesn't glitch on me, yes, um, I will save it and post it. Uh, apologies if it doesn't work because my IG is um, a bit funny with my lives sometimes. So fingers crossed. There's, this, there's <laughs> a spot now they save them. You can go and find them afterwards and repost them. I've, I've seen it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I think, be, I think you'd be okay. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully, yes, then you'll you'll be able to access this. Um is there is there a final like little um, like thing you want to say about just be nice project before before we say goodbye? Yeah, just be nice. You know, just look after each other. You know, <laughs> it's free. It's free to be nice to each other. Do that, and uh, you know, if you if you're concerned about doing good, just keep keep doing whatever you're doing, whatever you're good at. Keep getting better at it because you can't always predict where it's going to be useful. But the better you are at something, the more useful you are. So if you if you're feeling like you're not you're not having a direct impact. You're not seeing the impact right now. Don't worry about it. Have patience. Keep getting good at things and know that the better you are at stuff, the more impact you're going to be able to have down the track. Um, even if you can't see something right now that you're able to do, just keep getting good. Just keep getting better and, and know that you're setting yourself up for bigger impacts later on. Amazing. I love that. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for you. having me. What a great pleasure. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. I'll come see. I'll come see you over the the next uh, the next few weeks down the surf coast, and, and uh, that'll be lovely as well. Come down for a surf. That'll be fun. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Um, so we'll we'll post this on our on the surf camp um, IG page, and we'll probably chuck it up on YouTube if I can figure out how to do that as well. So it'll be awesome. Wonderful. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.